Uh, thanks to Tamara. I know she had a hand in this, and Linnell did all the, the grunt work, I suppose, <laughs> the groundwork anyway. Um, I'm going to start by reading a poem which is really a kind of aesthetic statement. Uh, one of the problems that I've always wrestled with as a poet, and I can't speak for, for other poets, but I suspect it's, the, it's a common problem, is the tension between the uh, abstract and the concrete. And I know when I was teaching creative writing, uh, you know, my students would often want to grab, reach up and grab the abstract, you know, and you'd have to say, okay, you pull it, pull it down, back down to earth here, and, and uh, then work towards that through things. And of course, uh, uh, Carlos Williams' famous statement about poetry should be, you know, through th ideas, not, th I mean, things, not ideas. And, uh, that's something that's always stuck in my mind. So this is the, the poem. This is an attempt to state or wrestle with that aesthetic, not to state it or to solve it. It's called, it's called The Angel. Here is the time that can be uttered. Here is its home. Speak and confirm. More than ever, things are falling away. It's from Rilke's Ninth Elegy. The angel floats like a maple seed above the ground. She drifts over dense thickets, bright with the flowers of blackberries, and over orderly regiments of grass gathering lawn by lawn. She even sees the common yarrow as it spreads along the road. How slender its wand, how finely divided its leaves. Yet she will not touch them, neither will she walk on the freckled ground, even as lightly as the parachutes of dandelions drifting behind enemy lines. We must not believe in her who passes through our bodies and through the earth, disturbing no particle of atom. She will not teach us the knotted language of thistle, which we must know. She will not take us under the hill where we must go. Uh, the next poem is from a kind of an experimental book that I just completed. Um, it began as a, I was trying to learn Chinese and the, the Chinese woman that I was working with was interested in contemporary American poetry. And I was all, you know, of course, uh, interested in Chinese poetry. Uh, so we started meeting uh, once a week and sharing. She'd bring a Chinese poem and I'd bring a contemporary American poem. And she would bring it in character, which I couldn't read, of course. And then she would translate it into pinyin, which is the alphabetized form of Chinese. And then I would be expected to extract some kind of rough uh, version from the pinyin. And so we did this for you know uh, a month or so and I've always admired uh, Ezra Pound's uh, poem, The River Merchant's Wife, which he says is not a translation. It's, it's, he, he calls it after Lipua. And so I thought, well, maybe I could try to write poems after these you know, poems that I was roughly translating. And it, you know, it just kept going. And finally, I ended up with a, with a book, which I, I despair of every find, ever finding a publisher for, because it's, it's kind of strange. It's got the Chinese character; it's on one page, and then my approximation of the poem on the other page. And yeah, so it was fun anyway, and I learned I learned some things. But anyway, I'll read a poem from that uh, manuscript and um, give you an example of what I was trying to do. The uh, poem is after Han Shan, who whose name means uh, Cold Mountain which is also the name of a Zen monastery. And he may or may not have been a real person, we don't know, and may have been a composite you know, of several people. Anyway, it's called, In a Far Country I Miss You. Dark willows like smoke, flowers like low clouds. Here I begin to live without you. There you've gone, there where you've gone, you are without me. We are at opposite ends of the sky. When will we see each other? I mail my words at the bright moon's building. You have freed our pair of swallows. 
Last night I dreamed of home and saw you weaving there. If your shuttle could feel my sorrow, it would stop its work. If you turned to face me, we would not know each other. We have said goodbye too many times. The coinage of our faces has worn away. Uh, the next poem is uh, not apropos of anything. It's uh, one of those things that just occurs when you're writing in a, a regular way. Uh, it, I don't know where it came from, and I won't say anything about it except to read it. <clears throat> it's called The Parenthesis. Before we were born, our parenthesis was already made, cut into an endless sheet of old boilerplate that lies in the shade of a mile-high tree. It has killed all the grass beneath it. The face of the metal is pitted like the moon. Clouds of rust roam across its airless space. The marks are deep in the steel and have shone like silver forever. While we are here, we can see clearly the left side. We celebrate it once a year. Each morning, we wake believing we live in infinite time, even though the right side gleams unseen only minutes away. Um, the next poem was, I actually wrote while I was visiting friends in Malaysia where I lived for a year. And uh, I was sort of, you know, reflecting on the confusion of re-entering Southeast Asian society and, you know, having been away for many years and, uh, and the confusion of life in general and then which, a confusion which has accelerated even more in, in the last, uh, you know, two or three years. And so I imagine uh, a creation, only it's from the point of, a point of view of Vishnu, the Hindu uh, God of creation, and he's got, he usually has, um, depicted as having blue skin and four arms. So uh, I just thought about Vishnu making humankind and then, you know, wondering, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> so this is called Creation Story. To clear a spot in chaos for creation, Vishnu ladled all the demons out of the churning sea of milk that would become the universe, but not before they fouled it. So he created fish to eat their excrement and clean the sea. For a while, the milk was good again, but then he made people who invented nets and caught all the fish and fried them up. Undigested, the demons' feces got into their cells and drove them mad so that they began to beat and tear each other. Vishnu put his head in all four hands. He'd have to think of something else. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like that, don't we? <laughs> something else. Uh, the next poem is um, an amalgamation of, of several dreams that I had over a period of really three or four years when I lost my parents and my middle brother. And of course, one of the things that when you dream, or at least in my belief, uh, is that your, your subconscious mind uh, tries to deal with things in your conscious life, make sense out of them, particularly chaotic or, tra or traumatic things. So your mind's already doing that in an underground level, on an underground level. And then I think the poet, uh, if he remembers, he or she remembers the dream when, when, when you awake, you try to use poetry to eat, further explain or mediate. But really, it's, you know, it's not an explanation at all. It's just an attempt to order a, you know, a, a chaotic and, and uh, disjointed dream state. So this is the dream, our dreams uh, melded together. The house with copper floors. Words carved on the beach are long overgrown. The house stands above with sounding copper floors. Below, the river falls narrow, swift, and deep within its rocky walls. I struggle up the slick clay bank between the house and tree. 
Iron rungs and thick silver roots appear, each with the head of a dog. I enter through the kitchen window, full of hunger. In the bedroom, desire for sleep clings to me like mud. My mother lies on a daybed. Fine dust floats in the air, then settles, silent snow in her mind. She cannot speak, but motions to the rear where I hear sounds of a thwarted car. Under the copper floor, the cellar booms like a drum. In the backyard, my father, stuck tight in the clay, guns the old roadmaster. A fireball shoots through the hood, and suddenly he is gone in his car. Far below, the river murmurs. My brother, filled with cancer, Silently signals from his John boat. I can't tell whether he beckons or waves. All around him, cold fish leap from the water with little cries of quick surprise. The last one um, uh, I wrote uh, when I was visiting friends in Spain and I was waiting for, I uh, had to spend the night in Madrid to wait for my flight the next morning, so I uh, sp spent the afternoon in the Prado Museum, which is one of the great museums of the world. And, you know, gr great museums wear you out. <laughs> <laughs> and so after an hour or two, I was, you know, sitting on a bench in kind of a stupor, and I was looking at the painting in front of me without really, rec you, know, you know, paying much attention to it. And then it began to come into focus. It was... Uh, Bruegel's uh, Triumph of Death, which is, uh, shows it's a woman, an ordinary housewife, and she's scuttling along the street, and then there's this huge lumbering wagon full of skulls bearing down on her, <laughs> which she doesn't see. And uh, then I looked around, and there were these heroic uh, pictures. You know, here's this ordinary you know, housewife, and then around her were all these heroic pictures of martyrs and saints and mythological heroes. And, and I thought that there was just something about that contrast. And that's one of the things that I like about Bruegel's paintings. They are always about common people, but some, uh, some supernatural or, or um, powerful element is working in the, in the painting. So this is just called In the Prado. In the elder Bruegel's triumph of death, the woman about to be trampled by the lumbering wagon of skulls had forgotten to buy bread. Her baby, full of colic, had disturbed her usual care. The son was hurried out the door, the husband gone without goodbye. Normal gestures left undone on this, her momentous day. Nearby, Thomas sticks two skeptical fingers into Christ's side. Hercules, all his arrows failed, embraces the Numaean lion. And modest Saint Agatha shields the awful wounds of her severed breasts. In their terrific moments, what did they recall of the transactions of the street? The mother about to die and the one by me holding up her baby, pulling back its diaper for a look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.